Hey guys, thanks for tuning in today. Today we're gonna to be talking about the second essential for growth and it's this, that in order to grow, we need community. Each of us as human beings have a desire to belong. We all long for relationships with people who care for us, who love on us, who protect us, who make us feel safe. We all have this desire and there's actually a psychological term for this and it's called belongingness. And every human being, regardless of where you live or when you've lived, has this need. Uh, and it's really interesting what some of the studies show is that belongingness is of one of the greatest influencers on our decision making. It fits right up there in the hierarchy of needs, right next to our need for things like food, water, and shelter, you know, the basic necessities. And it's really interesting because on average, people who satisfy their, their need to belong live an average of three to four years longer than people who don't. How exactly they found that out, I'm not sure, but that's just what some of the studies show. So, so it's really hard to understate uh, merely on a psychological level, how important it is for us to belong to a group of people. But we know this, and it's during seasons like this, we really feel this need, this longing to belong to other people. And I wouldn't really consider myself to be an extrovert, but it's been really interesting over the past couple of weeks how much that I have found in myself a, a craving almost to be with people. I miss hanging out with people and getting lunch and getting coffee. I miss playing basketball. I miss having the guys over for Bible study. I just miss being with people. And again, I'm typically not one of those kind of people, uh, but I can only imagine what it's like for some of you guys who are extroverts, you know, just this desire that you have to be with people. And what I found really interesting is that the times when I have the, this craving and the, the cravings the strongest is on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And that's times when I'm typically with you guys, when we're getting together to study God's Word and we're getting ready to worship Him. I, I long to belong to a part of a group where we're getting to do those things. And right now, I'm not being able to do that. And so I would imagine... Uh, that maybe you're similar in that similar boat, that you have uh, some of these same longings too. And if you don't already have them, I'm sure you will here in the next couple of weeks. But I'm sure a lot of your friends are feeling this way too. Um, everything in our lives have been put on hold pretty much. Uh, we've been sent home from our dorms. We've not been able to go meet with our classes. All of the communities and things that we were a part of uh, this last semester have been just kind of pushed off to the side. And so we, we're stuck at home. We're isolated. We feel like we're not doing much. And so all of us are, in a sense, rebuilding the kind of community uh, that we desire to have. And, and that's exactly what we've tried to do uh, for you guys as far as the college ministry goes. We, we realize that one of the greatest needs that you guys have is this need to belong. And so what we have tried to do is to tailor our college ministry specifically to meet that need. Uh, we know that you guys are, are going to be spending time studying God's Word still, but we wanted to create a space for you guys to experience some sort of resemblance of a community with one another inside of these groups that we're doing on Wednesdays at 730. And so if you're watching this and you're not a part of one of our groups, then I would encourage you to please, please let us know because we want all of you guys to be a part of this group. We don't want anybody to go through this, this uh, COVID-19 season or really any season of life without having a group of people that's around them, that's caring for them, loving on them, that they're being loved on, they're being challenged and, and encouraged with God's word. We want you guys to be a part of this with us. And so if you're not a part of it, please, please let us know. But we've also designed these groups to be very strategic. So we wanted them uh, to be opportunities for you guys to invite your friends into them because we know that not only do you have these needs to be a part of a group, but there are other people that do too. And in this season of life, it's a really good time for us to be able to, to talk to people about the hope that we have in Christ. And so I want to encourage you guys to be very intentional, to talk to your friends, to look around and think about your classmates. Think about those people that you were maybe trying to share the gospel with or trying to invest in. Uh, invite them to become and be a part of these Wednesday night groups. Bring them into your group. Love on them well. Just, just make them feel at home. Make them feel like a part of our group. Call them up. Invite them to join and, and see what the Lord does with that. I would love for us to be very intentional with this opportunity that we have to share the gospel and to share the hope of Jesus that we have with other people. And, and what I want to talk about today is how we go about developing a sort of community that allows us to grow in our relationships with Christ. And uh, there's a couple of components I want to share with you. And the first one is this, that a healthy Christian community is built on the foundation of Christ. Christian communities are a lot like buildings. Uh, and beneath every great building, there's a foundation, a solid foundation. If there's no foundation, then the building is going to fall apart. It won't last. And likewise, in order for us to have strong, healthy Christian communities that, that spur us on to be more like Christ, we have to have a rock-solid foundation. And what the Scriptures teach us is that the only solid foundation that we have is Christ Himself. And many of you guys are familiar with this passage. This is out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. But listen to the story, this parable that Jesus teaches. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew against it and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house. And it fell, and great was the fall of it. So here in this parable, Jesus tells us about two different men building on two different foundations. You have the first man who obeys the word of Christ, who builds his or her house upon the teachings of Jesus, on the word of Christ. And when the storms of life came, it it blew against the house, but the house did not collapse. Then you have the man or the woman who builds their house on the sand. They, They didn't obey the teachings of Christ, and they built their lives on the foundation of things of this world. Maybe it could be things like money, or it could be things like uh, people. It could be things like dreams and hopes. All of those things we, we build our lives on that aren't Christ, that aren't last, and that aren't eternal. And when the storms of life came and it beat against that house, the house fell, and great was the fall of it. In order for us to have these healthy, God-honoring Christian communities that, that our souls really desire and they really long for, we have to have a foundation that's built on Christ, who is the rock. And as the old hymn goes, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And that is very much so true. So Christ is the foundation of our Christian communities. And regardless of our differences, the thing that brings us and binds us together is our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. The Apostle Paul talks about it and about how Christ is the the cornerstone of the church, the cornerstone of of God's people in Ephesians chapter 2. And here's what he says in verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. It says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So the truth of that passage is that no longer are we strangers and aliens. No longer are we enemies of God. No longer are we defined by anything other than by our status as a member of the household of God. We've been brought into His family. Orphans have been adopted, and we're now sons and daughters of God. And that's the beautiful truth of the gospel. And so this is where our Christian community starts. It's built on the foundation of Christ. We're unified because of our our faith in Christ and the grace that He's given us. The second thing is that its purpose is for developing Christ-like character. So the first thing is that our Our Christian community is founded on Christ as the the rock. And the second thing is that our purpose is for developing Christ-like character. Um, The goal and the purpose of Christian community is to help us to be more like Christ. And we know that from passages like Romans chapter 8, that the goal of our salvation is that we would grow to be more like Christ. And so we build a Christian community around us and people around us who will help us to become more like Christ. And the Bible is really clear on how we're supposed to do that. The phrase one another comes up about a hundred times in the New Testament. And when you look at those verses and you kind of bring them all together, you notice a couple of common themes that show up. So there's a third of these one another phrases that, that deal with unity. So things like be at peace with one another from Mark chapter 9. Gently and patiently tolerate one another in Ephesians chapter 4. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving to one another again in Ephesians chapter 4. Bear with one another. Forgive one another. Seek the good of one another. Don't repay evil for evil. So those are, those are commands for us to be unified, to, to, to care for one another. Another third of them instructs us to love one another. So it says, love one another. There's 11 different references to that phrase that we are supposed to love one another. Through love, we serve one another, that we're devoted to each other in love. And about 15 of these one another statements, these commands, deal with humility. In Philippians 2, Paul writes that we're to regard one another as more important than ourselves in the same way that Christ did. He says to serve one another in Galatians 5, to wash each other's feet, to clothe ourselves in humility towards one another. And then the rest of them are things like this. Don't judge one another. Don't put a stumbling block in front of each other. Bear one another's burdens. Speak truth to one another. Do not lie to one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Pray for one another. Be hospitable to one another. These one another commandments show us what it looks like to help each other grow in Christ-likeness. And I want to encourage you guys to be thinking about what are some of the ways that you can encourage your community of Christians to be more like Christ? How can you serve one another? How can you pray for one another? One, One easy one that maybe I would encourage each of you this week to think about is how can you encourage another person in your Christian community? Maybe it's calling them on the phone and just 
offering them a word of encouragement about how you're seeing them grow like Christ. Maybe it's sharing a, a truth of scripture with them. Encourage one another, build them up, help them to grow in Christ likeness. And each week, begin to add one or two of those into the rhythm of your daily life to be thinking about how can I spur someone else on? How can I help somebody else grow in Christ likeness? Because the, the cool thing about that is, is if you're doing that for somebody else, there's a chance, there's a really good chance that somebody else is going to do that for you. And so mutually, we're all being built up and we're all being shaped to be more like Christ. As we live out these one another commandments, I have confidence that by God's spirit and by his power that we're going to grow and our communities are going to flourish and, and we'll be people who look more like Christ. And the third thing, Christian community requires three different things of us. And the first one is that it requires frequency. I've heard it said that frequency increases community. Everybody wants to have community, but a lot of times we don't want to put in the effort that it takes to develop that community or to develop necessarily the intimacy that we want with that community. And we need, we need to spend time with each other daily, daily encouraging each other, daily holding one another accountable, daily praying for each other, daily spurring one another on in love and good deeds. And if we're only engaging with people when it's convenient for us, then we're really going to struggle to build any sort of community that is lasting. And so I want to give you a couple practical encouragements as to what this could look like for you, especially in this season. So part of that looks like every Sunday, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we're going to be in, in a Zoom call. I would encourage you to join that meeting, to be a part of the Christian community that we're seeking to build or seeking to maintain with our college ministry. It also looks like you join in your Zoom meetings at 7.30 on Wednesday nights. Make that a regular practice. Don't, don't neglect meeting with your group. Don't let something come up. Don't miss out on that. We need you to be a part of this group, and, and you need us to be a part of this group. We need each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We need each other. We need to be with each other frequently in order to build that kind of community that we want to have. I think frequency also looks like developing some sort of routine uh, to where you're regularly communicating with people outside of those two, spe those two specific meeting times. Find a, a routine of where you're calling people, you're checking in on them. This extends to both your Christian community and the non-Christians that you have. Call them, check in on them, see how they're doing, encourage them. Again, these one another statements are so important for us. Check in on each other and, and use this time as a as an opportunity to grow closer in those relationships. Don't allow people to get disconnected and certainly don't allow yourself to become disconnected. Make sure that you're frequently engaging with God's people, frequently engaging with each other. You know, it could look as something as silly as, you know, maybe set up a, a FaceTime lunch or a FaceTime coffee. You know, a lot of times we spend time with each other over meals or over coffee. Do the same thing at home. And it might feel really weird, but have some fun with it. You can both eat lunch and use FaceTime. You know, thank God that we have the technology to do those kinds of things. But the point of all that is frequently engage with people. The more time you spend with them, the, the greater the level of intimacy that you will have. The second thing that Christian community requires of us is authenticity. And one of the things that I think students and people our age are really good at seeing is, is fakeness. Uh, we're really good at seeing right through people who aren't authentic, and we're really good at exposing a lot of that, uh, a lot of the fake things that go on. And, and it drives me crazy, and I think it probably drives a lot of us crazy when we see somebody act one way in one circumstance and then act a different way in another circumstance, or, or we see something that we know is fake, and it just kind of drives us crazy. Um, and the more we've adapted and developed in social media, the more fake things, you know, fake news, fake articles, finstas. We have all these things where fake things are being presented to us. And, and there's something inside of a lot of us that just craves those kind of nostalgic, back to when times were more simple. We, we want to go back to those old and authentic and kind of classic things. And in the same way that nobody likes fake things and nobody likes fake news, nobody wants fake friends. So I encourage you, in order to build Christian community, you have to be real with people. You have to be vulnerable with them. we got to stop working so hard to try to cover up all of our faults and all of our failures and all of our flaws, but instead allow those things to come out. Allow people to come into your life, and I know for a lot of us that's something that's kind of scary, but that's that kind of level of trust that we have to build with one another. And I know a lot of times people have burned us in the past, but over time we need to be able to, to let people into our lives. Again, the more time we spend with people and the more authentic we can be with them, the greater the level of intimacy that we'll have. So I want to encourage you, allow people into your life. Be vulnerable with them. Be transparent about the things that are going on. On the flip side, we have to be people who live with honesty and integrity. 
if people are going to be vulnerable in sharing things with us, then then they have to know that we're going to be uh, we're going to be honest and we're, and we're going to keep to our word that we'll keep those things. We'll be praying for them. We have to be people who who have integrity and not going off and gossiping about the latest news that we hear. We have to be people who are both vulnerable and and authentic and people who who live with integrity if we want to have good, healthy, God honoring community. And the third thing that Christian community requires of us is love. A community that's most attractive is a community that loves each other well. And I don't mean to sound cliche about all of this, but if you go back and you look at all of those one another statements, 11 of them are specific commands to love one another. And I think Jesus is very clear about that. If we seek to have good, healthy Christian community, then we have to develop an appropriate level of love for one another. Sometimes that looks like us just sharing a kind word with people. Sometimes it looks like us calling somebody when they're hurting and checking in on them. Sometimes it looks like us just spending time with people. There's, there's different ways that we all experience love, and, and part of loving someone well is knowing the ways that they receive love. But sometimes loving takes a little bit of a different form than what we might imagine at first. Sometimes the most loving thing that we can do for people is to speak the truth to them. Ephesians talks about how we're supposed to speak the truth in love. We need people around us. We need friends around us who care about us enough to tell us the hard truths because they're, they're warning us away from sin and they're helping us to be more like Christ. And we don't always receive that as love, but we have to see that as love. So let's learn to love each other. Let's learn to care about each other enough that we're not going to allow people to walk in sin. Let's love each other and help them as they pursue Christ. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the new commandment that Jesus gives to his disciples in John chapter 13 is to love one another. Here's what he says. This is John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then again in, verse, in chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus is praying to, to the Father, and he says this about his disciples. He's praying and asking God that they all may be one, that the disciples be unified. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so what Jesus is doing here, he's praying for unity and he's praying for love. And he tells us that the way that we love others is to be the way that he has loved us. And what I think is really cool about that passage in John chapter 13 is that the world will know us by our love. So if we desire to see people come to faith in Christ, one of the best things that we can do is to invite them in to a healthy, a loving community where they're going to experience that love that Christ has for them. We know that there is no greater love than the love that Christ has shown for us, that He gave His life so that we might have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And so let's do our best and let's do our part at creating a a Christian community where we're sharing that love with one another. And then let's be diligent and intentional to invite people in so that they too can experience the love of Christ. I want to offer you one final encouragement and one final thought, maybe even a little bit of a final challenge. And it's this, that healthy Christian community is something that is built, not found. A healthy Christian community is built, not found. And building relationships and building community takes a lot of work. Uh, We don't just stumble into relationships and we don't just stumble into community. It's something that takes a lot of work to build. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes intentionality to develop those kinds of deep relationships that we really want. And and there's going to be times... Uh, as you're building your community that, and, and as you're experiencing life in a community that people might not meet up to the expectations that you have. They might not care for you in a certain way that you were hoping or they might not respond to you or they might not do these things that you're expecting them to do or you might feel like you're kind of isolated and you're kind of distant. And in those moments, you're going to be tempted to just up and walk away. And I would encourage you, if you're in a place like that ever, you know, whether it's now or, or sometime in the, in the future, Uh, That if you're in a place like that where you're thinking about just upping and leaving a community because it doesn't match the expectations that you have or, you know, maybe because there's there's been some things that have gone on, I would just encourage you to stop right there and just to pray, to ask God to give you patience, to ask Him to to give you humility, to ask Him to to help you walk through this life. And and then I would I would encourage you to to go back in and I would encourage us to stop being so so much uh, of consumers and and be kind of shoppers of community and be be more like builders and architects of community. It takes a lot of work to build a community. It takes a lot of work to build relationships. And so let's get to the to the task of building those relationships. Let's not jump ship at the first sign of discomfort, but let's let that discomfort help us to grow to be more like Christ. 
So as we're laboring at these things, uh, I trust that we'll experience God's blessing in, in the way that He's designed for us to live, which is in relationship with Him and in relationships with others. So thank you guys for, for tuning in today. Uh, we miss you guys. We love you. We hope to see you soon. We're praying for you. If there's anything that we can do, please, please let us know, and we'd be happy to take care of you. Hope to see you soon.